And I think there will be many different lotteries that will be happening uh, that we could even we could even think about, we could even predict, right? Or for me, really, because uh, it's a little bit like your know, science work. You know, one question leads to another one. Uh, we are always going to solve problems that nobody has solved before, and that requires right creativity. It requires uh, a lot of uh, uh, you know thinking out of the box. Also, also you know how to uh, to keep people motivated. Uh, okay, it's not enough to say okay, I need this from you. Uh, it's also to make sure that you know I say that in a way that. Uh, I keep the team's morale uh, always uh, up, uh, okay, and uh, it goes without saying, you know, leading by example. The following is a conversation with Giuseppe Cataldo, an Italian born NASA engineer who, among other things, contributed to the James Webb Space Telescope and is now leading the planetary protection efforts of the Mars Sample Orbiter mission. He is a passionate scientist who is not afraid of sharing his love for space exploration and daydream about the future of humanity in space. Our conversation covered the topics of planetary protection from extraterrestrial life, astrobiology, what it takes to be a good engineer, and the role of creativity and leadership in the engineering process. This is the second episode of the Mandalo Podcast. I hope you will enjoy this conversation as much as I did. If so, please consider subscribing, sharing, and supporting this project. And now, here is my conversation with Giuseppe Cataldo. Um, you lead the planetary protection efforts for the Mars Sample uh, Return mission. Could you briefly introduce what is this mission, um, what is backward planetary protection, and what are the risks that we are trying to avoid? Okay, so um, uh, the March of Return uh, the campaign uh, has the objective to uh, uh, collect uh, uh, samples of uh, rock cores and regolith and uh, atmospheric samples from uh, uh, Mars, in particular from the Jezero crater, where the Perseverance rover landed uh, in February 2021. Uh, with the idea to learn more about uh, the geologic history of the Red Planet, as well as uh, the potential for um, uh, uh, ancient life on the Mars. Um, so the uh, Mars Observatory campaign uh, consists of uh, three flight elements, one ground element, one being the Perseverance rover that I mentioned before, and uh, two flight missions uh, that are currently in the design and development stage, uh, and then one ground element, which will be the, uh, the laboratory that will be built uh, to uh, um, basically uh, host the samples and uh, perform all the scientific analysis on them. Um, so when it comes to uh, planetary protection, um, so what do we mean by it? We mean uh, both protecting uh, Mars, in this case, uh, from uh, contamination that we might bring from Earth, mostly because if we were to find something on Mars, um, of, of interest to us, then the question would be, did we bring it there or was it already there? That's what we call forward uh, planetary protection. Uh, but because we are coming back uh, to Earth, uh, we need to talk about backward planetary protection as well. So it's really about protecting the Earth-Moon system uh, from uh, potential uh, you know, hazardous material uh, that uh, you know, we may be bringing back from Mars and it might uh, contaminate uh, the Earth uh, biosphere. Um, I mean, the risks are extremely low, uh, but they're not zero. And so NASA and ESA are, ta are taking a safety first approach uh, to uh, basically you know, um, eliminate the risks uh, involved with, with this. So it's really about designing uh, the systems in such a way that you know, we'll be able to bring back the samples uh, without, for example, breaking up in the atmosphere or uh, uh, breaking up on landing. Uh, so it's really uh, mostly systems engineering practices uh, aimed at uh, a building, uh, designing and building a system uh, that can accomplish uh, its uh, goal uh, safely. Okay. 
um, but so um, do you think there is uh, when dealing with uh, the possibility of uh, extraterrestrial life uh, um, an ethic of uh, space engineering like what are our duties with respect to other life forms uh, if they are there w what do you think uh, uh, terrestrial life uh, fits in the um, in the global life if it exists uh, in the solar system or in in the universe do you think we have some sort of duty with respect to other life forms so um i i, I you know, here i talked about uh ancient uh life uh on uh, on mars and um and so it's um really about you know finding i guess fossil uh records of um of uh you know potential life that might have existed on uh, on Mars and uh, I know that's uh, a little bit what I was saying before about for planetary protection right we want to protect the planet that we are uh exploring uh we don't want to contaminate them with you know with things that might actually uh uh complicate uh the scientific analysis um and and, and also I mean I I think comes with it, right? We don't want to contaminate a pristine planet that has never been touched by, uh, uh, you know, uh, by, by by human beings, basically. So, um, you know, we uh, we have standards and practices to uh, to to do that exactly because you know, it's a, you know planets are really new worlds, uh, and it's true that we receive pictures and data really on a daily basis now from every planet or solar system um, but uh, and beyond actually now with actual planets as well but uh, you know uh, it, you know it, it is important to uh, preserve uh, the you know the, the nature of uh, of those planets um, in, in, in a way that uh, you know allows us to uh, to learn more uh, more about them um, um and um then, you know, make the most out of uh, you know the scientific efforts that we're trying to uh, to accomplish by 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 going there mm -hmm. okay and um you have also contributed to the james webb space telescope um do you think um, this new generation of telescope can have the potential to unveil previously unknown phenomena and uh, in a way revolutionize our understanding of physics. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, um, it's, uh, I mean, whenever I think about it, it's uh, really amazing that we were able to build such an amazing, uh, phenomenal machine, uh, such as the James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, the the images and the data that we uh, that we receive uh, really on a daily basis uh, are really uh, revolutionizing our understanding of the cosmos. I've only been there for a little over a year, and the amount of uh, really discoveries has been um, unprecedented. Well, in terms of you know, scientific productivity of the telescope, it's really um, really really high. So hard that I can't even keep up with uh, you know uh, the daily news uh, on uh, you know that come from uh, from web. Uh, but uh, yeah, so uh, definitely we are learning uh, a lot more about uh, the the origins of the universe, the formation, the evolution of galaxies, the formation of uh, uh, solar systems um, and uh, exoplanets as well. Um, it's very interesting that. Um, I, I, I think there will be many discoveries that will be happening uh, that we could even we could even think about, we could even predict, right, or foresee really, because uh, it's a little bit like your know, science work, you know, one question leads to another one. Um, and so why we might have an idea of, you know, some questions or what we are trying to look for, but, you know, then there will be always uh, surprises coming our way. And that's something that many scientists uh, that uh, I worked with on the project uh, used to tell me a lot, right? Uh, so we know what we are looking for, but uh, we also know that there are many other things that we can't even think about right now uh, that uh, you know will uh, definitely surprise us. Um, and, uh, and so really, uh, 
I think, you know, I think stay tuned, you know, continue to follow the adventures of James Webb online and uh, I think uh, continue to learn from, uh, from it because uh, really uh, it's going to change our uh, understanding of the cosmos. Mm -hmm. And as you said, it is a, it is a wonderful machine and, um, and it's really amazing that uh, um, NASA has been able to, to put this together. And um, from an engineering perspective, when uh, addressing such a complicated mission, what do you think is the single most important thing to address when designing um, a mission as complex as this one? Uh, it's um, difficult to answer, like, you know, say what is the single most important because, uh, you know, we, we, we build missions based on uh, technical requirements uh, that, you know, ultimately uh, will allow the, the, the machine, the system to be built to accomplish uh, certain scientific goals. Um, and, and so it's really about, uh, you know, designing the system to be able to perform, uh, to meet the requirements, satisfy the requirements uh, in, in a way that, you know, uh, we are happy with. And I think um, for James Webb, for example, the requirements were, were not only met, they were exceeded by a very large margin, so much so that uh, what we are seeing right now uh, it's also the result of, you know, this extra margin that we built um, uh, into it. Um, and that that is really making a difference, not only in terms of you know, uh, quality of science, but also if you think about robustness of the telescope, um, you know, we're all, I think, a bit worried, but not so surprised to hear, you know, when the telescope was uh, hit by micrometeoroids uh, very early on, uh, right? I mean, we knew it wasn't going to happen sooner or later, uh, but of course we were like, okay, what's going to happen now, right? And uh, really nothing important really happened because of, of all this extra margin that uh, we had built uh, in it. Now, you know, the mirrors, the structure really built in such a way that you know, we exceeded the requirements so much so that now, even with that, you know, very small deformation caused by the micrometeroid, you know, uh, the telescope can still perform uh, very, very well. So, um, I think it's really about, you know, going back to your question about uh, uh, making sure that we are really, uh, uh, you know, uh, meeting all the uh, requirement, technical requirements uh, uh, in such a way that, you know, the, the machine you know, is robust. Uh, to changes uh, in, um, and it can perform uh, really, uh, really well. And that's really from a technical perspective. I can speak much more about other aspects of the project that are more like on the, uh, you know, project management or, you know, people's skills or communication, right, that are also very, very important in, you know, building a team that's capable of communicating, talking, and make sure that, you know, things are getting done properly. Uh, uh, but, you know, that's maybe for another question. No, but that's really interesting because I was also thinking about uh, how um, technically um, what should be done is very clear, but then uh, the doing of the thing uh, is, is another thing because in the end it's, it all comes down to teamwork and building a team that can do the, the job. So um, I, I'm also interested of, of this aspect of uh, being able to put different peoples together from different disciplines with different objectives all for the same vision and goal and i think it's also one of the most important parts of any mission as complex as this one yeah um, absolutely that's very important point so um definitely uh definitely very challenging uh but uh but yeah i mean you know with the right uh uh, you know, people and right uh, processes in place, uh, you know, uh, a lot of things can be accomplished. So. Mm -hmm. And um, do you do you know what's, what's something that uh, currently um, the scientists would like to discover with space telescopes, but that James Webb's uh, space telescope is not able to discover while uh, the next generation of telescopes will be able to do? Um, what's something we're trying to put into new space telescopes that are not currently in the James Webb? 
Yeah, so so uh, for example, the uh, the Roman space telescope uh, uh, started being uh, uh, built, um, and you know, so it launched, I believe, around or around 2027. Um, and um, I, I think you know, one of the key differences with James Webb uh, uh, is, uh, for example, it, you know, it will try to look for uh, you know, uh, um, dark matter, dark energy, uh, mm -hmm. you know, much more than James Webb can do. Um, and uh, it will perform, for example, a wide field survey of the sky uh, with a field of view that is, if I'm not mistaken, something like 100 times bigger than Hubble. Um, so we will be able to survey the sky, uh, you know, much, much uh, more efficiently than Hubble did. Uh, and uh, we will look at, uh, you know, astronomical objects, uh, really with different eyes, if you will, uh, okay, but, you know, uh, trying to look for these uh, other, uh, uh, you know, uh, characteristics of, of the universe that, uh, you know, James Webb was not built for. Um, and uh, I think Corolla will, will look even more at exoplanets, uh, for example, um, uh, more than James Webb uh, has already started to, to do. Uh, you know, James Webb really was on characterizing the atmosphere for exoplanets. And so we are getting a lot of data about that. So, so yeah, every telescope is really, uh, uh, you know, it's different objectives to accomplish and therefore, you know, built around those. Uh, so we got that and then, uh, and then even more, you know, uh, you know, think about the next next generation space telescopes. We are looking probably, you know, the 2040s. Uh, you know, what we call, uh, uh, you know, the concept of a large ultraviolet infrared optical um, a telescope. Okay, they will try to uh, uh, to look at you know a habitable uh, world. <laughs> Uh, so look even more for you know exoplanets and, uh, and try to uh, answer the question about you know the search for life, right? Uh, can this world host uh, life if we need it? Uh, you know, can we find it? You know, what are the proper the chemical properties, the physical properties that uh, uh, you know can make this uh, planet uh, habitable and uh, you know capable of hosting life? So uh, these are just some of you know the main scientific teams uh, that uh, the community is interested in, and that you know the uh, the scientific community is interested in, and the engineering community is trying to uh, you know to help uh, by building you know, the right instruments and uh, telescopes to uh, achieve uh, those goals. Mm, do you think, uh, is it credible to one day have a telescope on the dark side of the moon, a uh, sort of uh, uh, Arecibo uh, uh, sort of uh, telescope uh, that, because um, sometimes in science fiction uh, it's discussed about, uh, do you think it's a credible uh, scenario or there are easier way to do uh, space astronomy? No, I mean, definitely there are many uh, uh, reasons for uh, uh, building a telescope uh, on the far side of the moon, and uh, there are really a lot of uh, 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 publications on uh, this topic. Uh, I myself worked on it actually for a short period of time while I was doing my PhD uh, a few years ago, and uh, it's a very interesting concept that allows to do unique science. Um, uh, you know, just you know, to keep it short, like one of the reasons is also that you know, the, by, by building something like this on the far side of the moon, you know, shields us from uh, you know uh, electromagnetic interference uh, from uh, from the Earth, for example, um, and uh, that, you know, this allows. Uh, you know, the measurements to be uh, definitely better than we can do from, from Earth. Uh, so yeah, there are definitely, uh, you know, um, specific reasons uh, for, for doing that. And um, so, you know, never, never stop uh, uh, creativity, right? So we should always think big and, uh, and, and then uh, try to make it happen. So, um, um, so yeah, never say never. Mm -hmm. Okay, and um, regarding NASA in general, um, what, what are the objectives of NASA in the near future and in the distant future? Uh, yeah, 
Yeah, so we uh, we just talk about you know all these uh, new telescopes uh, that uh, are going to become you know the next fleet of uh, uh, observatories. Um, and uh, with that, I say that uh, you know keep investing uh, a lot in uh, technology development, you know technology that is needed, okay, to uh, support uh, the the development of these observatories. Uh, um, so definitely, you know, new types of instruments, uh, for example, technology more broadly speaking, okay, that will uh, enable uh, uh, these uh, future uh, discoveries. Um, and then, um, you know, uh, we uh, we are talking about uh, you know the Mars Sample Return uh, program with the idea of bringing samples back from Mars. We also talked about that uh, earlier on. Uh, so you know, for the planetary uh, and astrobiology uh, uh, community, right, to uh, learn more about the red planet and also uh, about our own planet uh, by looking at Mars as it was like, you know, uh, three, four billion years ago. Um, so, um, you know, we, we all know about uh, Artemis, the Artemis program, uh, the effort in NASA. Uh, it's leading to uh, uh, go back to the moon and uh, stay in a sustainable way. Uh, you know, it's all uh, in the news. Uh, you know, I, I, I really like the excitement that all these missions you know, generate in the public. Uh, when I hear you know, a lot of people talk to me about this, you know, it's great to, to see uh, the excitement and uh, you know, how these missions and you know, uh, really inspiring uh, the, the new uh, generation. Uh, so definitely a, a lot of that. Uh, so going back to the moon, you know, with people, with astronauts. Uh, so that's talking you know, about the human exploration side of things. Uh, so uh, and, and this is really you know, just the so the the few topics you know, uh, you know, I think areas that NASA is investing on, and then also I think uh, you know aeronautics, so uh, green fuels. Uh, Renavigation, more more generally speaking, right? Uh, a lot of efforts are going into that as well, um, and uh, that you know NASA is uh, contributing to uh, with a lot of partnerships. So uh, we are really touching different uh, areas, different you know fields, uh, and uh, and I like to say always that uh, technology for uh, for space. Or even for aviation, right? Uh, NASA always says, mm -hmm. you know, when you take a plane, think about it. You know, NASA is with you when you fly because a lot of the technology and NASA develops is on, on, on made of the planes that we fly with without even realizing it. And uh, all this technology, anyway, uh, you know, has a lot of implications in our daily lives. Uh, again, without even us realizing it. And, uh, and, and so all, you know, comes back to us uh, in, in ways that, you know, we can't even imagine. So. Mm -hmm. And um, focusing on, on space exploration and human space exploration, um, what is for you the importance of exploring space? Uh, what is the, the real motivation to, to go out there? Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, first of all, I think uh, curiosity, uh, that I think innate curiosity that uh, humankind uh, has. <laughs> Uh, to uh, explore and discover uh, new things, right? Uh, you know, history teaches us, right? Uh, you know, all these the first explorer that would, uh, you know, uh, you know, sail their uh, their ships and uh, and land, you know, on the new uh, on new ground, right? Uh, and uh, you know, on, on our planet, and then we 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 got to uh, you know step foot on the moon. Um, uh, you know, a uh, few decades ago. So um, I, I think that's definitely in that curiosity uh, to learn more. Uh, and, uh, and that's really what I think fuels, uh, uh, you know, scientific discoveries and progress in general. Um, and I think, you know, connected to that is really the idea that uh, with, with curiosity, we can, uh, uh, we can improve, right, uh, our our world, our society, by you know creating all these technologies that uh, you know can improve lives uh, in many different ways. So it comes down also to a practical aspect of it, of how to channel uh, this curiosity uh, towards something that uh, you know really uh, has an impact uh, on uh, people's uh, lives. Um, and 
definitely you know the <laughs> if you will you know the the goal of exploration you know in a very broad sense <laughs> um and, and and i think i, I you know i i feel like i touch this you know i uh, every day every day uh, you know uh, with my job um uh, when you know i, I see i uh, redevelop new technology you know uh, always thinking about you know new uh ideas um uh, new ways of doing things uh that uh, that again you know uh, uh, leave a clear uh impact uh on uh, on 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 the world so. mm -hmm. And um, do you think there is also um, an objective uh, in terms of safeguarding life uh, as we know it uh, by by colonizing maybe other planets, by going to the moon uh, um, as a sort of way to secure our existence on the universe if something had to happen to life on Earth? Yeah, yeah I think, uh, you know, uh, we have an example of that with the recent uh, uh, DART uh, mission, right? Trying to uh, deflect the orbit uh, of, uh, of an asteroid, right? To prepare uh, mm -hmm. humankind really for like, you know, something like that, you know, where to have, where, you know, where we to find out that an asteroid is, you know, like uh, collision path with Earth, you know, how can we uh, defend our planet, okay, from such a danger. So, uh, uh, you know, definitely uh, we want to preserve, uh, you know, humankind and uh, uh, make it, uh, you know, uh, lasting for a uh, for a very very long period of time. Um, and uh, and uh, and it is true that you know, if we think about the physics of uh, I think the solar system, right, uh, all stars to uh, die, and I think uh, that time will come for our uh, our star uh, as well at some point. Uh, very far down the road, it will affect you and me right now. But uh, you know, uh, so uh, you know, I I, I think uh, you know, uh, it's uh, interesting to think about you know, uh, uh, what should we do? Right? Uh, would be have to just go to another planet, or maybe we will need to leave the solar system or uh, go very very far, you know, to make uh, humankind kind of, you know an interstellar uh, species. Uh, um, so, um, you know, it's, uh, I think, uh, always interesting to, to think about this uh, kind of problems. Yeah. yeah. So if you, if you really have to think, uh, far in the future, where do you think humanity will be reasonably in, let's say 500 years? Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, we are making a lot of efforts to, uh, you know, and going back to the moon, colonize the moon, I mean, we, you know, stay on the moon sustainably and, uh, and, uh, you know, we hear in the news about, you know, other efforts of, uh, potentially going to Mars, um, and, uh, you know, yeah, like, you know, maybe 500 years we will have, you know, definitely the capabilities and the processes in place to, uh, allow, for example, travel, uh, you know, uh, probably, you know, to the moon and Mars in a, you know, sustainable way, uh, you know, 500 years is a very long period of time. I hope that by then we'll have a better understanding of the effects of radiation on the human body for, you know, uh, interplanetary trips like this. Uh, and uh, we'll have solved these problems, you know, by making these trips, you know, faster uh, and more, uh, I think, you know, suitable to, uh, you know, the human body. Um, so, you know, we are seeing uh, several efforts happening in, uh, you know, kind of going in uh, in that direction. I don't think we're quite there yet, but, you know, uh, we, are, we are working toward it and, you know, 500 years, you know, it's a long time. Uh, so we may as well, uh, you know, start imagining maybe, you know, uh, uh, humans uh, maybe living on, uh, on the moon and Mars uh, uh, con uh, uh, continuously. Um, so. Yeah, well, uh, sometimes in inventing the future, it's, it's easier than predicting it. So I think it's, it's interesting to, uh, to discuss uh, about possibilities and discover yeah, what we could do. And, um, and going back to engineering in general, um, do you think there is any difference between uh, Apollo era engineers and today engineers? Uh, well, I think... Uh... 
there's definitely a lot more uh, knowledge available uh, uh, nowadays than it was back then. Uh, the one thing I hear sometimes when I talk to uh, engineers from the previous generation, uh, you know, sometimes you know they, they say, "Oh, you know, I wish I had I had had this capability." And you know, back 20, 30, or 40 years ago, right? Um, so yes, right, we have capabilities and knowledge uh, that uh, we didn't have uh, 50 years ago. Um, so uh, I, I think that's definitely a difference. But uh, well, then in terms of, uh, I, I see actually uh, many similarities as well. I think definitely that problem solving mm -hmm. attitude, right? That uh, um, troubleshooting, uh, being able to, uh, you know, uh, solve problems uh, with out of the box ideas. I mean, definitely, uh, that's something that uh, is very common. Um, and uh, again, you know, I, you know, like, uh, new generation may rely on, on different tools, different uh, methodologies than 50 years ago. But uh, I think uh, in terms of, uh, you know, skills or you know, definitely it comes down to, you know, okay, we need to solve problems, right? How do we do this? Uh, how do we do this together, you know, working in a team? Uh, and, um, and, you know, so it's about, you know, how do we, you know, lead the team and, and you know, things like this that uh, are, I think, again, are, are common. And uh, another thing also that I, I think we, uh, we have nowadays that, you know, a lot of uh, lessons are learned from, uh, you know, those missions. Uh, from you know the errors that were made um, uh, during the Apollo and beyond as well. So uh, definitely, you know, we we try really hard to incorporate uh, such lessons learned uh, in current uh, you know practices, uh, learn from those, and, uh, and, and and then you know design uh, the systems you know, as best as we can. Uh, so um, yeah, so these are I think maybe, maybe you know, some of the uh, differences and similarities. Uh, between you know, today's generation and uh, uh, you know, uh, previous ones. Yeah, because uh, what, what's remarkable for me is how um, they managed to do uh, to accomplish what they've done, like putting a man on the moon without all this previous knowledge, without uh, uh, standing on the shoulders of giants. Uh, the, yeah, that's amazing yeah. for me. And I want to add one thing, actually, I think passion really comes down to a lot of passion, right? Mm -hmm. uh, enthusiasm and, you know, that uh, we engineers put into, you know, all of this. Uh, I think that's, I think, the main driver, right? Uh, a lot of passion and uh, having, you know, a goal, a goal in mind, you know, that goal is, you know, mission success for all of us. Uh, and I think, you know, really, you know, they drive us, you know, every day. Uh, so much so that you know, I never find uh, a day uh, in my job that you know it's like boring. You know, every day I wake up like you know, always you know, yes, I'm looking forward to going to work, right? Uh, and I think that's probably another common uh, aspect that uh, is still true. I think you know, 50 years uh, yeah. after the so. And um, you have um, you have talked about uh, problem solving um, this. Uh, this uh, feature of engineers. So, well, what does it take for you to be a good engineer? What kind of mindset? Yeah, so definitely a very technical mindset uh, that requires uh, definitely uh, you know very uh, a, a lot of knowledge, very specific knowledge sometimes. Uh, which is important to, to what we do. Um, and, uh, but, but, but also, um, I think the kind of higher level of knowledge that allows, uh, uh, you know, people like me, you know, in my role of like systems engineers or managers to uh, understand the big picture, how every uh, system, you know, comes together. Um, and, um, and, and so like, you know, not, to lose that big picture, right? Uh, uh, be able to understand uh, what we are doing and why we are doing it. Um, and, and so uh, it is true some engineers are, you know, very specialized in what they do. And, uh, and we definitely need those, right? 
uh, the open are down to say you know the mechanism for a certain part of the hardware uh, so we need that uh, and then we need also engineers that are able to uh, again you know put all together uh, uh, you know to realize you know the the ultimate system that will perform you know, the, the the mission and uh, and so it definitely requires also a lot of uh, at least you know when I think about my daily job it requires a lot of uh, uh, interaction okay with uh, a lot of teams so understanding yeah. each team's needs uh the requirements that they have um and then uh make sure that uh, the team uh has all uh you know all that they need to perform the job successfully uh so knowledge uh, uh tools capabilities i uh, make sure that they are able to do this right uh without any problems so uh, and then communication uh, is really paramount to the success of a team. So uh, engineers you know, uh, have to communicate what they do, uh, communicate as clearly, uh, you know, among themselves, uh, with uh, you know, the, within the chain of command, make sure that the, everything comes across very, very clearly. Uh, you know, the, the tactical aspects of what they are doing, but also your problems. Uh, make sure that we are all aware of what's going on and we are able to uh, uh you know to uh, take action as needed uh sooner rather than later um so really when i think about my mindset yeah it's a very technical mindset but also a mindset that very uh like uh, focus on the results they were trying to achieve and uh and therefore okay it goes without saying it's a mindset that has to also take care of the, you know, the, the people uh, aspect of the role, right? So yeah. uh, in, uh, ensuring that I'm actually uh, working uh, with, uh, with the people, uh, you know, as uh, best as I can uh, uh, to, again, allow the flow of communication and uh, ensuring that everything uh, is being done uh, properly. So, you know, a close hold, uh, when we have any uh, and, and, and bring everyone okay together to uh, make sure that uh, we're all working towards the same goal uh, okay and then another thing I said you know in my daily job is also you know how to uh, to keep people motivated uh, okay it's not enough to say okay I need this from you uh, it's also to make sure that you know I say that in a way that uh, I keep the team's morale uh, always uh, up uh okay and uh it goes without saying you know leading by example so i had to be the first one to uh you know to be happy about what i do uh motivated uh even when you know we have very hard problems to deal with challenges that maybe we were not expecting uh, but it's important that uh as a, as a leader as well right uh mm -hmm. i make sure that uh you know i i say you know yes we can do this uh, together and uh, you know maybe you know, I had to go through some rough times now okay no worries at all we are gonna go through this together right uh, so also how to uh, to make uh, how to do this right uh, the, the, the right way uh, it, it is extremely important in the end of the day uh, technical knowledge doesn't really lead you anywhere uh, unless you know how to use it right and, and that's what people do so uh, uh, you know it's really the true aspect of the of the I think you know of how to work uh, together for a common goal yeah the, I, I absolutely agree I, I really like this uh, lead by example uh, um, uh, approach and um, and so um, do you think there is also a role of creativity in the engineering process like do you um, do you feel like that's uh, an important part of it? Absolutely. Um, we are always creating something new, uh, you know, especially in you know, an environment like the one I'm in every day. Uh, we, are, we are always thinking of, you know, the next generation of technology that, you know, we, mm -hmm. we need the next generation of uh, missions, of, uh, right? Um, and so it's... Uh, extremely important because uh, we are always going to solve problems that nobody has solved before 
and that requires right creativity it requires uh, a lot of uh, uh, you know thinking out of the box uh, that uh, allows us to brainstorm ideas uh, very openly and uh, you know no matter how crazy it might be right um, and, uh, and that's how you will make progress after all so um, it's uh, creativity is a very very important role uh, it will allow us to uh, again to come up with uh, uh, you know new uh, new approaches methodologies processes uh, uh, that eventually will become you know things that are going to build and you're also going to stay um, and, and, and you know they, they will make a difference so uh, absolutely yeah creativity is part of uh, uh, you know of all of this and, uh, and uh, we need a lot of it yeah it's it's interesting because um, uh, there is this book called sapiens uh, um, that came out uh, some years ago in which the author argues that uh, the reason why humans are leading the planet uh, is uh, is two factors imagination and large scale cooperation and um, when you when you're discussing about uh, working on hard projects working at nasa what does it take to be a good engineering in the end it, it comes down to to these two things like being able to imagine and being creative of uh, uh, what the future can be what we can achieve, but also the ability to imagine uh, and model the physical world as an engineer. And then the other aspect, really large scale cooperation, because we couldn't do this by ourselves. You really need to be able to communicate the vision and work as a team to achieve uh, these big obje objectives. So it's it's really it's really what makes us human in a way. Uh, working in this in these environments with these objectives it's it's really interesting um do you now uh, what is uh, one engineering problem that you are proud to have solved in your career that you would like to share uh, yeah so i think uh, I'm, I'm still very uh very proud uh, to uh have uh, contributed to uh, the optimization of uh, several uh, models uh, that were uh, uh, used uh, for the uh, design of the James Webb uh, Space uh, Telescope. Uh, it really came to me as a, as a challenge uh, that you know I I had to solve and. And they thought like I could solve because of some technical knowledge that I had learned uh, in, in school, uh, uh, including during uh, my PhD. Um, um, and, uh, and well, I said, okay, I'll, I'll give it a try. And uh, and I think um, I think it was uh, you know something that took a uh, you know a lot of effort, uh, but that uh, eventually uh, was uh, successful. Uh, and that uh, has gone a long way since uh, then uh, because he, he continued to grow more and more, uh, you know, and, and now it's become, uh, you know, uh, it's become like, you know, the, the way of, you know, solving many of the problems now, uh, you know, for example, I'm, I'm still using this uh, and and taking it to the next level, right, for no matter for return mission that I'm working on. Uh, so uh, what makes me proud is the fact that, well, first of all, I was given the, the challenge, uh, so the fact that I think, uh, you know, my my supervisor kind of, you know, believed in the fact that I could uh, solve it, and then I think the fact that from there, right, uh, you know, a mission like James Webb Telescope was definitely, uh, uh, and you know, uh, received this contribution and then uh, made a difference there. And then from there, now it's making a difference in other projects and missions that uh, that, that we have, right? Uh, so uh, it, it's something that you know uh, definitely makes me makes me happy. Uh, when I see you know how much it grew um, and uh, and uh, you know how. Um, uh, all the help really that uh, it, it keeps uh, giving us uh, in terms of uh, really uh, 
uh, making the most out of uh, you know the mathematical motion we use, uh, the experimental data that we, com that we collect, that we gather uh, to validate our models, how we do it, and uh, how all of this is done in a way to uh, inform and, and inform and guide the design process. <laughs> Uh, uh, you know, throughout the entire life cycle mission, um, uh, the entire life cycle of the mission, um, and um, and um, and ultimately, you know, to uh, uh, also you know guide the decision making process. You know, when it comes down to you know make a decision, okay, how do we do that? Right? You no, know, we need data. We need uh, you know numbers. You know, we need information that we need to uh, you know get from somewhere and. I think some of the, the methodologies and approaches that uh, uh, have developed with my team uh, have uh, you know, really helped a lot in that direction. Um, do you think there will be, or there is already, a role for artificial intelligence in, in space engineering? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, there's definitely a lot of it already uh, uh, embedded in many of the of the tasks you know, that, that we do. Um, so uh, even part of you know, my job, I think, relies on, on that and uh, the artificial intelligence and machine learning techniques. Uh, I think um, you know, we, we, see, um, we are seeing more and more of that. Um, and uh, and you know, it's important to, uh, uh, yeah, to, to understand right, uh, the, uh, you know, what these capabilities can do. Uh, what they can bring to the table, and uh, and uh, really uh, how to uh, best uh, use them. You know how to make the most uh, out of them, uh, especially when they you know help in terms of, uh, for example, efficiency, like right? making certain processes more efficient, right? Mm -hmm. Efficiency means uh, you know less time and uh, and less money, right, for for a manager. And, uh, and that's uh, you know really really good, but but then you know we also need to be careful about the technical aspect of the problem, right? So understand also you know again what you know this uh, uh, this can bring to the table. Uh, understand also the limitations of of them, uh, and, uh, and and again you know that's how we make progress, right? Uh, by you know by looking into into you know things and. Uh, Understanding how they work, understanding you know, what they can really, how they can make a difference, um, and while at the same time, I want to say this again, you know, also having a clear understanding of their uh, limitations. Um, but uh, but yeah, definitely, you know, there's uh, more and more of this into work. So. Yeah, what I was thinking is that uh, uh, as we discussed creativity, uh, sometimes uh, there could be a sort of artificial creativity if uh, some solution that you didn't expect come up from uh, um, some sort of artificial intelligence it's a sort of uh, alien creativity which is contributing as well to the um, to the design um, would you go to space if you were offered the possibility yeah I would love to yeah why not I mean I think it's uh... Uh, definitely something that uh, I think nowadays, uh, you, know, you know, it's become or it's starting to become uh, more and more uh, accessible. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you know, I, I hope someday to to have the the possibility to uh, to do so. Yeah, I think it will be a great uh, uh, adventure. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, and uh, after all these years uh, working in the space industry, um, do you still get a sense of amazement when looking at the night sky um, or it has become something ordinary? Um... No, I think uh, for me it never gets uh, boring, it never gets old, right? Uh, every day when I cross the gate uh, to go to my office, um, you know, I'm still amazed, right? Uh, by by just you know where I am, right, on a daily basis, and then um, you know look at the sky. I mean, just again a sense of uh, curiosity that you know makes me think more and more. Okay, what's out there? Uh, yes, you have learned a lot, 
about uh, the universe, uh, but we have so much more to learn about it that makes me look uh, uh, very much forward, right, to, to learning even more, right? So I, I'm always, again, you know, always interested in, uh, you know, reading more about the new discoveries that, uh, uh, you know, all the telescopes that, you know, we have around are, are making um, and, and and just the other sense of the, um, really, like I said, you know, amazement um, that, uh, you know, uh, in a way, it's part of what uh, keeps me, uh, I think, motivated, right, uh, in, uh, in what I do. And, uh, and don't get me wrong, you know, some, some days can get, I say, you know, uh, maybe boring, maybe more difficult, depending on what's going on, right? But uh, I, I think exactly, you know, knowing that I'm doing this for, uh, you know, for something maybe, you know, bigger, yeah. kind of helps, you know, me and, and I know many people that I know as well that, you know, kind of keep moving, right? Keep moving and uh, saying that, okay, you know, maybe, you know, this is hard now, but now when we think about what we're going to accomplish, then again, you know, we are able to uh, uh, stand up again and keep moving. So, uh, so definitely, you know, uh, it's, uh, um, I think, you know, I feel a little bit, you know, definitely uh, lucky uh, yeah. to, uh, to, to have a job like this that allows me to, uh, uh, and um, in, the, in this context, uh, what do you think is the role of, of humanity? Do you think that uh, given our, um, the fact that we are, are alive, that we uh, are intelligent, or at least uh, we define ourselves so, and um, do we have a sort of duty um, towards uh, um, investigating the universe and going out there? Do you think that there is a duty embedded in the uh in in being human so i, I mean I, I i think again probably you know goes back to uh what we said before when it comes down to uh you know exploring what's out there i mean um when i think of the universe it's so vast so big right and i wonder why is it right why do we need such a big universe, right? Is it enough to adjust the Earth, the Sun, and maybe a few more planets around, right? Uh, uh, do we really need, like, you know, such a big universe? So, so that's, you know, quite a lot that makes me think, yeah, maybe, you know, uh, we have all those stars that we see every night in the sky, you know, out there, just for us to, you know, to go explore, right? And go see uh, what's out there. Um, so uh, it's definitely not trivial. As we know, um, uh, I think, you know, we have started with, you know, the moon and now more and more with Mars and uh, uh, we definitely have a lot of, you know, robotic uh, exploration happening, right, uh, around every planet or solar system and beyond. Uh, think, you know, think about the Voyager um, spacecraft. Um, so um, I, I think there's definitely so much to learn about that. Uh, uh, I think when I, you know, you mentioned the word beauty, uh, I, I think, you know, if we, if we think about it just in terms of curiosity, well, I'm like, I will call it a duty, but if I think about, if I connect that with the fact that, you know, we can explore the universe, develop technology that are going to make humanity better, and then in that sense, you know, maybe we can call it a duty mm -hmm. to say, hey, you know, by doing this, by investing money into all of this, we are actually making our lives better, uh, and and therefore, you know, I think you know it's definitely good, right? If we had not done that, mm -hmm. we would still be, you know, in the, you know, the Stone Age, right? Uh, and so, um, I think you know, it it's just you know how humanity uh, makes progress. Mm -hmm. Okay. To conclude, uh, my last question will be: if you have uh, any suggestion of books that you would like to give. Yeah, so uh, there's one book that I want to recommend. Uh, kind of like goes back a little bit to what I was talking about regarding uh, leadership. The book is called uh, Virtuous uh, Leadership by uh, uh, Alexander uh, Howard. 
um, uh, in a book that I read uh, not too long ago, and uh, it really gave me a different perspective of what leadership really is and what it means. Uh, you know, sometimes you know we may think of leadership as oh, you know, leaders are born that way. And this book actually teaches us that uh, no, we are not born that way. You know, you, everyone can become a leader and not only a leader, can become a virtuous leader by uh, fostering and growing in those virtues, you know, which are the strengths that every leader should have. I think the book mentions a few such as, uh, for example, humility, magnanimity, uh, which are often overlooked. Um, so I think, uh, yeah, if you want to learn more about how to be a, a virtuous leader, I mean, that's definitely a book that I would like to uh, to, to recommend. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot for, for your time, for this discussion. It was very interesting for me. And uh, yeah, thanks again. Yeah, well, thank you. It was a pleasure to be here. And, uh, uh, you know, I, uh, I look forward to uh, more of this. This was my conversation with Giuseppe Cataldo. And now, let me conclude it with some words of wisdom by Antoine de Saint-Exupéry. If you want to build a ship, don't drum up the man to gather wood, divide the work and give orders. Instead, teach them to yearn for the vast and endless sea. This was the Mentolo podcast. Thank you for listening and I hope to see you next time.